Yo, Philly, how you doing? Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball, past, present, and personal. I'm Bill Cachetis, your host on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. On this show, we will revisit the major league career and post-baseball life of Pete Rose, who remains one of the most respected athletes in the city of brotherly love. Not only does Rose hold the record for most games played, most at-bats, and most hits in the history of baseball, but during the five years he played in Philadelphia, Rose was the catalyst for a young Phillies team that went on to capture two National League pennants and the first ever world championship in franchise history. This week I'm pleased to have as my guest, Coach Chick Kennedy, the editorial director of Time Incorporated Books. He is a former assistant managing editor at Sports Illustrated, where he covered Major League Baseball. Mr. Kennedy is also author of the New York Times bestseller, Pete Rose, An American Dilemma. Welcome to the show, Kostya. Hey, Bill. Thanks a lot. You uh, you wrote and published your biography of Pete Rose in 2014, nearly a quarter of a century after he was banned for life from Major League Baseball for betting on games. By that time, three commissioners, Bart Giamatti, Faye Vincent, and Bud Selig, upheld the ban. There had already been other books written about Rose's banishment, most notably uh, Michael Sokolov's Hustle, The Myth, Life, and Lies of Pete Rose, which was done in 1990, and Rose's own account, My Prison Without Bars, uh, published in 2004. And he actually admitted in, in that book to betting, in baseball, uh, betting on baseball. Why did you feel the need to write another book? Well, two things, really good questions. One, uh, only two commissioners actually upheld the band because Giamatti delivered the band uh, and was not alive to uphold or deny. Um, you know, the ban from baseball isn't really so relevant to the question of Pete Rose about whether or not you think he should be in the Hall of Fame. So it's, it's not really material to the dilemma. So that didn't really affect things. In terms of the uh, the fact that there had been – uh, Sokolov's book in 1990, which I thought was an excellent book, there, there were sort of two reasons. One, um, there hadn't been really anything about him in about 25 years. And My Prison Without Bars, it's just, uh, it's just Rose just dribbling on and on. There's nothing there really. It's just him sort of, uh, you know, equivocating and, and putting himself in a favorable light. It's not really a, a um, a narrative about him the way Sokolov's book was. Um, so two things, I mean, first of all, there's a whole second act of his life, right, which his whole 25 years went on where he had become incredibly, you know, made a great living as a <laughs> signing autograph. His, his sort of the controversy around him has continued to grow. Um, even since I wrote the book, there's been more steps in, in his sort of regard. Um, but I, I started doing one. Well, I did a book on Joe DiMaggio that came out a few years before this one. And during that book, I went and spent time with Rose. Uh, my book was about DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. And I went to see Rose uh, in Las Vegas where he was signing. And he I, I wanted to talk to him because he knew DiMaggio and because he had a 44-game hitting streak. He's the only one since DiMaggio to even get over 40. And we spent a whole day together. Uh, during which time a couple of things happened. He, during the day, he had a little TV set up beside him. He set up an autograph table signing for people and all that. And on that TV were, were the races from Hollywood Park. And as I'm sitting next to him, every now and then he's watching the races and he'll pull out, you know, it's a Thursday afternoon in the teeth of the recession. This is not like the Kentucky Derby, that the people who are betting on this game, on, on these horse races are obviously experienced betters. Um, and he would reach into his pocket and pull out a wad of cash, uh, 400, peel off $400 bills out of a, you know, a, a wad of 20 of them or whatever it was, and have somebody go put a bet on the fourth race or the sixth race or whatever. So he did that throughout the time, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's totally legal to bet on, ho on horse races. Many people do. Um, and, and, again, nothing wrong with it whatsoever. I will say that if you are banned from baseball for gambling, and have sort of a PR issue with it, and there's somebody, and you're in public, and there's a reporter, I was working for Sports Illustrated at the time, next to you with an open notebook, maybe you don't do that, but he just couldn't help himself 
for doing it. And it was fine. I didn't question it at all. And I was there to talk to him about DiMaggio, and that was it. But at the end of the day, though, he felt the need. He said to me as we were, like, departing and saying goodbye, he said, you know, that's all the betting I do. I just bet on the horses. No, 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 no sports or anything. And I, I knew that that wasn't true because the thing that I knew about people who, who know him. But I also hadn't asked him that at all. And it made me realize sort of how much – this whole thing has been sitting on him all these years and the sort of internal struggle he's had with it. And, and, and I just felt that given that time, that time passage and that development, there's reason for a book. And the last thing I will say is um, I did enjoy Hustle quite a bit, but I felt a little bit like even from the title of it, you know, the myth, the life and lies of Pete Rose, there was sort of an act to grind with Pete throughout the whole book. Like, we, we don't like this guy. We're telling you why he's not a hero, and we don't like him. And whereas Pete's book is like, I'm the greatest person of all time. And I really felt like there hadn't been a book that looked at him in both sides. You know, to my view, he was an absolutely marvelous player, and there was so much good to, to like and love about Pete Rose and and so much to detest about him as well. So I was trying to sort of carve it down the middle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, 56 was an excellent book, as is, is this one. Uh, I really enjoyed reading both of them. Uh, Thank you. you were When you were with Sports Illustrated and you covered MLB, did you actually cover uh, the, the whole Dowd report and, and the banishment in 89? No, that's that's like before my time. I wasn't Prior covering time? at that okay. time. Yeah, um, I mean, I was, I was aware of in, in the aftermath, I did a couple of sort of follow-up pieces, meaning like, Ten or fifteen years later, but uh, I didn't. I didn't cover it at the time. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> baseball actually kind of uh, cultivates these characters, like uh, like like Rose, uh, someone who really can't help himself. Uh, while his his statistics clearly are Hall of Fame worthy, uh, some of the, the 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 characteristics that made him such a great player that. Uh, you know the the consummate uh, uh, risk taker on the field, um, the, the insatiable desire to to, to win. Um, you know, are, are some of the very same things that that led to his downfall. We had another guy like this in Philadelphia, in, in Lenny Dykstra. Um, right. You know, uh, so I, you know, I guess uh, the American dilemma. The subtitle of your book is. How do you not allow a player like Rose, who did so much good for the game as an ambassador, uh, you know, how do you not let him into the Hall of Fame, but also punish him justly for uh, disobeying baseball's cardinal sin? It's a great way of putting it, and I think that that's uh, true. In Lenny's case, there was a home run he hit for the Mets uh, in 86, I guess it was, that that sent him the wrong way. He decided he wanted to become a power hitter after that. He hit one in the playoffs against the Astros mm-hmm. and then got into his whole, you know, performance-enhancing stuff. Obviously, he had a couple of great years. But um, so, but, but in Pete, you know, you're absolutely right. That is the dilemma. How, how do you not put him in the Hall of Fame and, and uh, punish him? I, I think it's also a little more subtly there's a dilemma like, what do we make of him? What, what, what do each of us on sort of our moral compass make of somebody – of this type, and how do we sort of parse that? Uh, I, I mean, in, in terms of practical sense, um, w- whether or not he's he's in the Hall of Fame is that's the question. I mean, he he should he has been and would have to be banned from being in baseball. I mean, there's no question. It, you know, like when recently Rob Manfred, you know, is after my book came out, but Rob upheld the ban again. And there's no way you could possibly have let him back again. I mean, he's still best on baseball legally, but he, he still bets on baseball, right? So it's not even really a, a choice about letting him in the game or not. There was just no way, no commissioner, it could have been his best friend, but if he cared about baseball, there was no way to possibly let Pete back into baseball. So the dilemma is really, so he's got that punishment, and he should have had it, and he earned that punishment. He could never, you know, manage the Reds. He could never do anything in the game and so now you're sort of saying well do we celebrate him uh with acknowledgement in the hall of fame do we uh honor our game by allowing him to be voted on for the hall of fame or do we make a 
a stand and say, no, you know, if you do something that endangers our game in that way, we won't let you in. Um, and that really is that's that's absolutely the 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 crux of it. And it and it's, you know to this day it's not an easy question or an easy answer. Mm-hmm. One of the many things that impressed me about your book was the the human side of of Pete Rose, and I think you were really spot on nailing it. Um, you know, you go into some of the endearing qualities uh, in the early 1960s when he started his career with the Reds. He embraced his black teammates at, at a time when it was so unusual uh, in a place like Cincinnati, which was just over the you know the border from northern Kentucky. Uh, we know throughout his career, Rose inspired his teammates uh, here in Philly. Mike Schmidt credits him with his own success and for being a, a catalyst to enable the Phils to win their, their World Series in 1980. Um, but having been in Rose's presence and, and, and spoken with him, I thought what was so perceptive was uh, in your opening chapters, you're talking about when he makes an appearance, uh, he he really engages the fans. I mean, if it's a young ball yeah. player, he'll give the kid advice. He shakes everybody's hand and just holds it that extra long second. Uh, you know, he looks each and every fan straight in the eye and thanks him for coming out. I mean, he, he did this to me. It was a baseball card show in Philly um, every year um, about a week before Christmas. And he looks me in the eye and he says, Thanks for coming out. Merry Christmas. And it's kind of like, man, what a what a great guy. How could a guy like this bet on baseball and do so many of the the decadent things that uh, you know he's accused of doing? And yet you point out in the book that you know Rose was his father's son. Harry Rose was that you know that that good old guy. Um, you know, a, a guy who was, was a stand-up man. Uh, and, and you also contend that if Harry Rose, uh, you know, didn't die in 1970, that, and let me get the words here, uh, Pete would not have been banished from the game and later sentenced to prison. Instead, he would have, you write, found it in himself to stop gambling uh, to stay away from the trouble he courted, to admit and rectify his mistakes, and to stand up and conduct himself the way his father had. Uh, it really sad. I mean, really sad in the end. I mean, it, it, as I was reading the book, I'm thinking, well, American Dilemma, this man's an American tragedy. Yeah. Uh, he's certainly an American original. There's no question about that. You know, um, you've talked about a lot of things here, but I think you're right in terms of the way he interacts with fans and he, you know, he'll remember if you, if you, if you're a fan who has kids or something and you met them once, the next time you see him, he'll remember if you do. Uh, if, how are your kids? What's going on? Are you still playing ball? That kind of stuff. When people pay to be, to, to get Rose's autograph in Las Vegas, and again, this is why there aren't a lot of people for, for whom this sort of setup would work to be be one place and sign the autograph day after day, the autograph itself is not worth anything at this point. It's worth very little. It's it, it, just because he's signed so many. Um, but they're paying partly for the experience, for being with Pete, for talking to him, and, he, and he's great. He really is. He uh, he wants to be paid for his time, but then he delivers. He wants to work for it. And so he he does that very much with fans. The, the Mike Schmidt thing, you know, I spent a little time with Schmidt, and it was a couple of days later that uh, Mike sent me an email that was so sort of rich in its in its detail of what he felt Pete had done for his career and meant to him that I just included the email verbatim in the book, um, and it was just very powerful what, what, the way he said it, said it. Um, you know, I, I think the passage you read, and I don't have the the book right in front of me. Um, I present that as, as a view, which I think is is, is has merit that uh, Harry. The, the people feel like he would not have gone off the rails the way he did if Harry had been around. Um, obviously, we can never know that, and we can't sort of say somebody's father died, and so therefore they're, they're no longer accountable for their own actions. I mean, obviously, Pete did all these things. 
But what you can say about Harry's influence, so Harry, you know, worked at the Fifth Third Bank in Cincinnati for 30 years. He went to work every day. He got off the uh, uh, got off the bus and ran up the hill to home. He didn't walk. Uh, Pete saw all that. He was he was right there with Pete, practicing, making sure he put his work ethic in, no matter what. If Pete didn't hustle a ball out, his dad just wouldn't come to the next game. Um, so Pete learned he better hustle. Uh, and his dad played in, in very good sort of semi-pro football leagues uh, in the Cincinnati area, playing until he was in his uh, mid-40s. Um, so he was quite a good good athlete on the amateur level. Um, and he, he, would, he would sort of lay down the law with Pete about the way things should be, and Pete would respond, you know. Um, Pete would go – if he didn't see his dad at the Reds game already, when Pete is now uh, wins Rookie of the Year and is a, an All Star, and he doesn't see his dad come down to a couple games, and he goes and Dad, what's going on? Why haven't you come? He says, We well, haven't been seeing your mom for a few days, have you? And he says, No. He says, We better go see your mom. And so then Pete will go home, and his mom will cook for him, and he'll spend a little time, and then the dad will come to the game. So Pete, his dad's death, there is no question that it. It left a huge void. Um, and, you know, maybe the biggest epiphany that I came to, Bill, was a sort of realization, I guess this kind of later in the book, that Pete knows how disappointed his father would have been in him. There's no question about it. And there's been so many times, I mean, now it's a little late in the game, but there were so many times since 1989 including at the moment, that Pete could have come forward and said, not just I did it, but yes, I did it. I'm so sorry I did it. I made a mistake. Let me make it better. I will do X and Y, whatever it would be, you know, some community service, some go to gambling addiction place, all of that stuff. He could have so easily done that, and baseball has big arms. They would have welcomed him back in. They They would have loved to have Pete Rose uh, in general in the family and more crudely as an asset for them, right? That baseball wanted it. And Pete could never do that. And part of me feels that he knew he had to punish himself. He had to live with what he had done. Wow. And you were always accountable under Harry Rose's ethics. If you did something wrong, you paid the price for it. And I think Pete has, you know, could have easily made his life different, and he didn't, and he's taken the punishment. Wow, you know, I, I went to uh, to college in Eastern Indiana and spent a lot of my college years at, in the nosebleeds in Riverfront Stadium. Um, now, of course, Rose was was gone by by that time because, uh, you know, he had he was in Philadelphia. Um, but I spent a lot of time in Cincinnati, and when you say Rose had difficulty. Uh, admitting the the, the gambling, uh, he wasn't built that way. I mean, he just wasn't built that way. And I don't think, you know, the the, the culture uh, in Cincinnati, the working class uh, blue collar culture, is is built that way. I mean, that town is is really a blue collar, hard drinking, hard living town. And particularly the west side where he's from, there's, there's a, you know, a pretty clear division in Cincinnati, which has blurred a little bit over the years, but it's still east side, west side, which was, and he was from the west side by the river, um, which was very much its own kind of place as you're describing it, uh, in the 60s, 50s, 60s when he was, when he was there. No, absolutely, as you do in your book. I mean, there's a history of gambling there, the riverboat gambling and, mm-hmm. and the like. Uh, and yet at the same time, that's why, Cincinnati embraces him. I mean, he is beloved, and and most of the people, I think, I really do believe most, if not all the people who are Reds fans in Cincinnati, don't give a damn about his gambling. They're all, he's always going to be special. Um, and what was so interesting to me in, in your book is, you know, you write that that fact was not lost on Johnny Bench. I mean, you look at that big red machine. They had the grade eight on there. I mean, we're talking about some phenomenal players, Tony Perez, Joe Morgan, um, you know, jo- Johnny Bench. Um, was there some jealousy between uh, particularly the two, Bench and Rose? 
Oh, there's no question. I mean, look, they, they 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 loved each other in certain ways, right? They respected each other immensely. Like, there's no question that the bench um, respected Pete a lot. But for, for all the things you you were saying, like, you know, Pete was from Cincinnati. He was one of theirs, and he played like you know, like every game was his last. And Pete was just going to be number one. And in some ways, bench for his prime was a more dominant and more valuable player. Uh, and, and certainly in the aftermath, uh, you know, he lived a life of, of doing infinitely more sort of charity and community work, being much more sort of a, the good citizen than Pete ever was or ever considered being, uh, in the way Johnny gave himself. And so therefore he, I think he had a little resentment, um, about that. But I, I think in some ways that softened and more recent, most recently when I saw them this year at Pete's, um, uh, statue dedication, and you know Joe Morgan was there, who's had severe health issues, um, and and Perez and uh, seven of the great eight were there, and and there, there's definitely an understanding of of what they did, they did together, and I think that ultimately that wins out, um, but there definitely is a, a a sense of jealousy between the two, and particularly particularly Johnny of of Pete. I don't think Pete feels that way of, of Johnny. Yeah, I, I don't think so either, because when Bench was uh, inducted in the Hall of Fame, uh, Rose stayed away purposely. He didn't want to take the spotlight off of off of Bench. Uh, uh-huh. Interesting, and you mentioned this in your book, in in Bench's induction speech, he doesn't he doesn't credit or thank any of his teammates. You know, I mean, and and, and I, I mentioned that, and that is that's the kind of thing that everybody in Cincinnati realized that, right? Pete goes through and he lists like person when when Pete, I mean, Pete didn't have a Hall of Fame induction speech, obviously, but Pete is always listing the, this teammate and that teammate and and everything in public things. You know, and here's Johnny in the spotlight, and he literally did not mention a single teammate, uh, and and that that is why there's a certain element of that which. There's so much good you can say about Johnny, and I'm not saying that that's such a horrible thing, but that's definitely noticed by by the populace in Cincinnati. No, I, absolutely. I mean, Rose is a consummate team player, and 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 Bench, and don't get me wrong either. Bench was one of my heroes growing up. I would love to write a biography uh, on him someday if he ever agrees to it. Um, but you know, if you talk to Johnny Bench about Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame. He actually gets angry now. I mean, he he. Everyone knows he opposes Rose's reinstatement, uh, and and he really doesn't want to deal with it anymore. Uh, he, he and he doesn't want him in. I mean, it's very clear. Um, so I, I, you know that jealousy continues. Whether it's more on well, I mean, obviously, I guess it's on on Bench's side more than well. He side. also he also gets annoyed, you know, just because people always asking him about it, you know. Yeah. And they'll, hey, Johnny, what do you think of Pete? Uh, not that many people say, hey, Pete, what do you think of Johnny? Uh, yeah. And so that's a question that Johnny's had to deal with, and I think that's part of his his. I think it's an annoyance and all that. I don't think that there's sort of a deep seated. Uh, you know, I think he'd put his arm around Pete if he's there and, and, and talk with him and, you know, remember that time against, you know, we did something with, with Bill Gullickson kind of thing. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll have those moments together. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rose leaves Cincinnati in free agency after the 78 season, um, signs with the Phillies. Uh, when I was doing my research for a book on the 1980 Phillies, I learned from multiple sources that Rose bet heavily on sports, uh, always using either a member of the local media or a personal gopher, Tommy Giosa, uh, to place those bets for him. And some of those bets were allegedly, uh, allegedly on baseball. In fact, Philly's ownership decided to let Rose go after the 1983 World Series because of her growing concern about his gambling. Mm-hmm. This was this part of the double life you suggest Rose was leading, uh, that he, he goes his own way? He never really went out with his teammates or even really talked with them about his private life. I mean, this is something that has always intrigued me because particularly, you know, when he talks about Mike Schmidt or when Mike talks about him, it, it, it just sounds like, wow, you know, they're best buds, you know, on the field, off the field. And reading your book, it's pretty clear that he had really kind of a double life. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he did have that double life, and and not so much. I don't think it's it's that he felt he was gambling in secret. Like he talked about it all the time. Right? He talked about like. Yeah, they only play Monday Night Football so you can make up what you lost on Sunday, right? And he went to the dog track and he, you know, bet on on things and was open about it. Not not about his baseball betting that he kept quietly. Um, but I think he just was kind of a kind of to himself. He, you know, as we, you know, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't like to go out in that sense. Um, he liked to get to bed early and get up early and get ready for the baseball game, and he liked to gamble. Um, but it's not as if his double life involves sort of like hanging around and gambling par- parlors and stuff like that. As you, as you said, he often usually had other people placing his best for him, and then he would sit around and watch sports. I mean, it was kind of – you ask people who like ran with Pete for some of those years, and they're like, well, it was kind of boring actually. They just kind of went home to the hotel and watched – watch TV. Um, so it was a double life uh, in that sense, but it wasn't sort of, um, you know, it wasn't what might be suggested by that. Uh, it's sort of some kind of glamorous or seamy uh, other life. Yeah, that, that 1980 team was really clickish as well. I mean, you had a core of players who were uh, fundamentalist Christians and Christian athletes. And, and that clique kind of hung together. I mean, uh, Mike Schmidt, uh, Gary Maddox, uh, Jim Cott, uh, although he was gone by the time Rose, uh, you know, came there. And there were others like Dick Allen, Dave Cash, although those guys were gone too, um, you know, by that time. Um, and then, you know, there were players like McGraw, Christensen, uh, you know, who hung out. Carlton was, uh, you know, um, really kind of to himself as well. Um, but Schmidt and Carlton did mentor uh, a lot of a lot of guys. Uh, it seems both on and off the field, where Rose, uh, you know, did his mentoring all within the confines of uh, of the playing field. Um, and, and they loved him. I mean, they they really right. they really loved him, and he was a fantastically entertaining uh, player. You know, you tell a story in the book about his uncanny ability to hit a baseball not only with authority but control. And the story you tell uh, is that uh, he's on the on deck circle and he's being heckled all game by a leather lung fan in a seat down the third baseline. And before Pete steps into the box, he winks at his Phillies teammates and says, watch this. So he goes up and he keeps on lining foul ball after foul ball straight at the heckler, almost hitting him in the head. I just love that. I mean, and, and Phillies fans just love that, too. I mean, that's what we're about. We're, we're a lunch pail blue Oh, yeah. I mean, Larry, Larry Christensen talked about that. You, you know Larry, obviously. Yep. And, and yep. he um, – I mean, he said that that's the kind of stuff where they just, like, loved him. You know, they're oh, like, yeah. this guy is a god. Are you kidding me? You know, um, so it's a great kind of, great, great way to stand up for yourself, right, and sort of just show who's in control. Yeah. No, he was He was definitely He was definitely a Philly kind of player. Uh, and, and I couldn't help but notice some of the parallels, too, between – uh, Rose and, uh, and the guy he was chasing all those years, Ty Cobb. Uh, you know, obviously Rose was in the, in the, uh, end of his career when he was with, uh, the Phillies, wasn't in the best of shape, so the way he tried to preserve his, his energy was by going to sleep early. Well, Ty Cobb also played his last years of baseball in Philadelphia with the old A's in, uh, 27 and 28. Did the same thing often went to mm-hmm. sleep early, saving his energy for the game. Although I, I, I would have to say that uh, Rose did uh, save some energy for his trysts with the young female groupies he called hard bodies, where uh, Cobb uh, you know, didn't, didn't do that kind of thing. Um, you know, Rose and, and, and Cobb are an interesting pair. Uh, would love to have heard what Cobb would have had to say, uh, about Rose and, and chasing after his his record, but Rose knows the history of the game too. I mean, I've talked with him about it, and he's, his knowledge is very impressive, especially of Ty Cobb. Yep, 
big fan of, of Ty and, and you know, he used to call uh Frank Robinson the black Ty Cobb, right? Like he, he loved he loved he loved Frank too because he played but sometimes you don't think of him that way because he's such a power hitter and, and different body type and all that didn't but he was a, a hustler just like that. Um and uh Pete yeah, Pete knew the game. He always knew the game and, and he cared about knowing it and he was aware of his own place in it. Um, you know, you'd ask him when he born when when was he born, he'd always say nineteen forty one, the year of Dimaggio's streak. Um, and he, he cared about Ty Cobb, he cared about guys like Dimaggio, and he cared about the game before him and what he could learn from it. Mm-hmm. Um, Kostya, one thing I was a little surprised about uh, in, in your book was that you, you didn't explore as much as I kind of expected uh, Rose's managerial career. And, mm-hmm. and to me, I think that's the pivot point. Um, Rose was a pretty successful manager. Uh, his six-year tenure, he posted a 426-388 record, which ranked him fifth in Reds history for wins. Uh, Reds also posted four second-place finishes in the NL West, and many baseball writers also credit Rose with developing the team that Lou Pinella inherited and led to a world championship in 1990 as well. And the mm-hmm. question that keeps on coming back, and, and, and you did suggest an answer earlier in our conversation, but if Rose was betting on his own team, he must have been betting on them to win. Yep. Shouldn't that make a difference in the eyes of baseball? Well, no. I mean, I don't think – look, of course he's betting on them to win, right? Because, I mean, like what book he's going to take to bet if you're going to bet on them to lose. You know, I never understood really that. You'll be out of business pretty quick if you're going to let a, a manager bet with you that his team is going to lose. Um, and he obviously can control it. So, uh, I mean, I guess to some people, look, it's not like Joe Jackson, who it, people now question it, but he said multiple times on the oath, I threw the game, I agreed to throw the game, I took the money for throwing the game. Like, so he did that. Um, I think he was trying to win, but, but it's not, listen, it's not so much, and not that this would have been okay or kosher by baseball rules, but it's not so much me saying, hey, Bill, I'll bet you 50 bucks. On the on the Reds tonight, he had this whole crowd of people, gamblers, illegal gamblers, with money tying back to whoever it was with serious money that could back these kind of bets, um, and giving them this beachhead in the game. Uh, and you just can't do it. You know, you can't have gamblers coming in. You know, people say, and this is, could be true, that you might misuse your bullpen. You might use players a little differently if you're betting them to win uh, on them to, the team to win. Um, they say, oh, well, he didn't bet every day. Uh, he bet, so, like, he, he didn't like to bet when Gullickson was pitching. I guess he didn't trust him. And that's kind of a signal to other gamblers that you don't have faith in your team. So there's nuances like that which are real and which, which, uh, passes a degree of inside information to gamblers. Um, but the main thing is that the rule is no betting on baseball because if, if imagine if, you know, you owe half a million dollars, which is the kind of money that Pete was getting into. And we've always been on them to win. But now somebody has something over you, right? They can say, hey, you know, if you can help the Reds lose a couple of games here, we could maybe let some of that. Now, that didn't happen, and I'm not suggesting it did, but it's very easy to see that it could have. And if you're going to protect the integrity of the game, you have to have a zero tolerance. I mean, there's just no, there's no question about it. Right, and so that's why I said at the top, like there's no chance he could have been allowed to be back in the game as a manager or a hitting coach or anything. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You can't have let him in in that circumstances. Uh, it's a totally separate issue from the Hall of Fame. But um, so th- that's kind of my feeling on what I do think that in absolute terms and in how you feel about Pete as a as a person. The fact that he'd never been on this team, that he only bet on them to win and never tried to help them lose, it's huge in, in terms of how we evaluate him as a competitor and as the integrity of his own sort of clock. Uh, but in terms of baseball's response, I don't think it matters at all in terms of what they had to do. Mm-hmm. It's it's clear that Bar Giamatti agreed with that assessment. Right. Uh, he retained John Dowd to investigate the gambling charges. Uh, against Rose in April of 1989, and then according to the Dowd report, which was presented to Giamatti in May of that year, 
Rose allegedly placed as many as 52 bets on Reds games in 1987 alone, wagering as much as $10,000 a day. Uh, when Rose was confronted with uh, that report, he responded by denying all the charges, and he filed a suit against the commissioner's office contending that he had prejudiced his case and could not provide a fair hearing. That is, Giamatti could not. Giamatti prevailed, though. He won in federal court, and afterwards they entered into settlement negotiations. That settlement was reached on August 24, 1989, and Rose voluntarily accepted a permanent place on baseball's ineligible list. In return, MLB agreed to make no formal finding with regard to the gambling allegations, and according to baseball's rules, Rose could apply for reinstatement in one year. But here's the catch. Giamatti insisted that, quote, there is absolutely no deal for reinstatement. And later, at a press conference, the commissioner voiced his opinion that Rose did indeed bet on baseball. Kostya, shouldn't that have nullified the agreement in favor of Rose? No, no, I mean, no, that whole thing was just such a red herring that they, you know, Rose's, Rose's lawyers went in so aggressively saying, yeah, look at this commissioner, he's just a college professor, we'll roll over this guy. They were so arrogant. And they, just, I mean, that, that, that had no legal basis or anything. That was just a complete red herring. And what Bart Giamatti said, baseball had no finding. You ask Bart Giamatti, the private citizen, what he thinks, he can say just like you and I, he can say whatever he wants. There was no contingency whatsoever on that, right? Um, it, it, he, they weren't even interested in having to say it. They, did, they didn't care if they said whether he could bet on baseball or not. They just had to get him out of the game and explain why they were doing it. And, and by the way, like, Giamatti was heartbroken over this. He loved Pete Rose. They would have liked nothing more. This was the, the easiest investigation they ever had, right? I mean, John Down went in. Within two weeks, they had like 12 people corroborating, showing slips with Pete's <laughs> return checks on it. Uh, the dates were all set up. You go and you look at the Dowd report, and the fact that people for so long believed Pete Rose, I mean, you read that thing for five minutes, and it's clear that he obviously bet on baseball and bet often on baseball. So I just think that, like, a lot of that is just, it's just noise. It's what people sometimes do if they want to distract from things that are actually going on or actual issues. Like, Pete's whole, like, harping on that. It, to me, it's just so sad that Pete didn't didn't just come out, and we talked about it earlier, but it's still the central thing, and just man up and say, all right, Dowd, you got me, you know, you, you, you SOB, uh, I can't believe you got me, but you did, and this is what I did, and how can I make things better? And if he had done that, everything would have been different. But this whole kind of thing about trying to find, like, this little loophole and that little loophole, it just, it just got him in even deeper. Well, I think, you know, talking about loopholes, I think uh, the latest development in this case is, is – I think has has really sealed the deal. He'll never get in. And that li latest loophole uh, involves something that John Dowd himself mentioned on a uh, radio interview in in uh, nearby Westchester. Here, uh, apparently, when Dowd was doing the investigation, he also found out that Rose was having uh, allegedly having a sexual relationship with a 15 year old girl while he was playing for the Reds in the mid 70s, and he stated that on this radio show, uh, and, and, and Rose has now taken him to court. But the fallout from that has, has been great. Uh, that allegation led the Phillies just this past August to cancel their right. plans to induct Rose into their Hall of Fame. Um, and you notice he's not on these Fox broadcasts anymore, even though he was actually an excellent uh, baseball analyst. Um, yes. He's no longer on the Fox Fox. Broadcast. I mean, and and uh, you understand why would people want to associate with somebody who admittedly had these engagements with somebody who was 16? So he, he's arguing, no, you can't say she was 15, she was actually 16. I don't pretend to know the answer. I don't know if anybody will ever know the answer. But Pete, it's just his same arrogance. He should. He might have been unhappy that Dowd was saying it, 
um, and it doesn't speak well of John Dow that all these years later he's going out and saying that kind of stuff about Pete. It's, it's irrelevant. But at the same time, you know, it, it, you can't sort of side with Pete on the on this issue of, of you know having relations with a with a girl, uh, and he just completely got himself. Uh, it's the same thing. His arrogance about this gets him in trouble again, and he and his advisors completely miscalculated and did absolutely the wrong thing in terms of uh, of doing that and deprived him of, of a night, you know, and, and deservedly so. Again, he made his own bed. This whole thing is Pete having made his own bed uh, from beginning to end, and this is the latest, as you say, it's the latest instance of it. So here we have Rose. He's applied for reinstatement with every commissioner uh, since uh, Giamatti. Vincent ignored him. Uh, Selig, uh, you know, just ignored him. Manfred finally said that it would be, quote, an unacceptable risk to allow him back into the game, something that you earlier said you agree with. Um, so where, where does this leave Pete Rose? If he can't be reinstated, there's no chance of a Hall of Fame induction or any possibility of returning to the game as a coach, a manager, or an executive. Uh, can he still serve as a useful, uh, a useful role as an ambassador of the game uh, within the United States or, and or between the United States and other baseball playing nations? Is that even in the cards? Would he be good at it? Where does Rose stand now? Well, it's a good, it's a good question, and again, it, it's really too bad because Rob clearly left the door open for Pete to to have a more prominent role. It was only after Rob's uh, sort of very generous he had to ban him, as we talked about earlier. We had no choice, but he clearly said this shouldn't impact how he's viewed in in non uh, baseball circle, meaning non-competitive circles like museums and honors and stuff like that. The very next day after that, it was a, it, the, the Reds decided they would put him in the Hall of Fame. He got he was going to get this honor from the Phillies to be in their Hall of Fame. He got the job at Fox. I mean, Manfred had really opened the door for Pete, um, and Pete got himself in trouble again. And I think that look, he's going to have to wait for time to go by that people can have this thing with his with the uh, young girl. Fade and and maybe it will and maybe it won't. Um, you know, he, Pete is a very he's a great ambassador for the game. He loves baseball more than anything. But remember, he only does this stuff when he's getting paid for it. So he's only it's only a question of whether he can get a job that will pay him to do these things. Um, and I think it's going to be very difficult for him to to get. I mean, I think he still will get a standing O when he when he walks around in, in Cincinnati. Um, but there aren't, really aren't a lot of opportunities left for him to to be what what he could have been, which is this incredible, uh, paradoxically, and that's the whole dilemma: value-oriented ambassador of the game, values being hard work, hustle, give the fan their money's worth. Um, those could have been the bedrock of Pete instead of all the other stuff that it really is. Mm-hmm. The book is Pete Rose, an American Dilemma by Kostya Kennedy. Kostya, thanks for being with us. It was a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate it. Great. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, and uh, anytime. Really enjoy talking with you, Bill. And thank you, Philly fans, for tuning in. See you next week for another podcast of Philadelphia baseball, past, present, and personal. This is Bill Cachetis rounding third and heading home on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network.